Father, we need you in times like these. We say thank you tonight. Thank you for those that are coming in to Bible study, oh God, and even those that are on the way. We thank you, God, for being so faithful unto us, oh God. Even when we have not been faithful, you have still been faithful unto us. And tonight we say thank you, oh God. Thank you for your goodness, oh God. Thank you for your love and your kindness. Father, thank you for your mercies that were renewed even this morning. Thank you tonight. Thank you, God, for being with us, for being with us throughout the day, oh God for leading us, for guiding us, for even protecting us from dangers seen and unseen. Father God, we say thank you, God. We honor you tonight. And Father, as we prepare to start our Bible study, Father, we invite your spirit and your presence to be with us tonight. Lord God, I ask you to illuminate our minds and give us divine understanding. I pray, God, that you will anoint this Bible study to teach your people, to edify your people, and to open our eyes that we may see in your word and like never before. Father, we say thank you for all that shall be done. Let shackles be removed from our minds. Give us our hearts of understanding, and we thank you for it all. It is in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it is 7.01. I started just a minute early or so because we have a lot of road to cover. Amen. Um, before we go any further, I, I'm, I'm sorry I was remiss to do this. Uh, Sister uh, Rhonda uh, Grissom lost her mom this morning. Amen. So we want to, uh, since I started in prayer, y'all just remind me, we'll close out praying for her and the Finch and the Grissom family. Amen. She had been sick for quite some time. I remember going to see her when she had those, she was always going back and forth with the hospital. And But you're talking about a precious, sweet woman. She was always so kind. I, you know, I would go to see, check on her and I would leave blessed. Amen. You know, that's that's the beautiful thing about the spirit of God. You can go and, and visit and, and spend time with one of his children. They may be down or going through something, but then you'll leave edified. You, you know, you'll leave blessed. You're going to be a blessing and you'll end up receiving a blessing. Amen. Amen. So, y'all, please don't let me forget. We'll close out in prayer for Sister Rhonda and the Finch and Grissom family. Amen. Uh, we thank God for Bible study on last week. Sister Kelly did a phenomenal job. Amen. Let's give God praise for her teaching. We thank God for the amen. Amen. Uh, so we thank God for God using her in our midst. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to jump back in it. Uh, so if you did not get I think it was two weeks ago. If you didn't get the handouts, they're right there, so please get them. You will need them. The two handouts, the church age handouts. Please get them if you don't have them. If you left yours home and you need an extra copy, go ahead and get, get them. There are two handouts that you'll need because this is an open book test. Amen. We have two major things we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to take a look at the church age, and we're also going to deal with the topic, start the topic, can a Christian have a demon? Amen. We're going to deal with two things. We're going to kind of, we've been talking about the church age. What is the church age? Who's in the church age? Uh, we're going to try to finish that out tonight. And then we're going to start a new topic is, can a Christian have a demon? Amen. So we're going to spend time with that. So uh, the first part will be more like a review, like an open book test. So you will need both of those handouts. Even if you already have you left at home, that's fine. Grab another one. So if somebody want to pass them out, if that'll make it quicker, because we got to jump into that. Uh, Brother Calvin, just go ahead and just grab the whole thing and just pass them out. Go ahead and pass them out so everyone can get one. Thank you kindly. Yeah, make sure everybody get it. Amen. Everyone, everyone need that. Uh, sir, would you get that microphone so it don't fall off there, please? It's on the edge. I don't want it. Great. Thank you so much, Brother Carlos. Amen. So we have been thinking, we have been talking about the church, right? Not White Oak Spring Missionary Baptist Church, but we have been talking about the church age. Amen. The church age, not how, or how old the church is, but the, the actual, the, the church age. I'll wait a few seconds. I know everyone is still trying to gather your handouts. Uh, these were the same ones we passed out a couple weeks ago, so hopefully you've had time to take them home, look over them, uh, take a look uh, at, at them as such. Amen. I will wait about 30 more seconds can, so we can make sure everyone has it so we can all dive in. 
Does everyone have it? Does everyone have it? Let's, can we do this in 10 seconds, everybody? Can, in 10 seconds, can everybody get the handouts? Because we, we got a lot to cover. I want to make sure you all get this. I don't want to leave anything on the table. So within the next 10 seconds, can everybody get two handouts, please? Amen. Thank you so kindly. Thank you so kindly. All right. So you have two handouts before you. One is both of these handouts come from the book Dispensational Truth. We talked about that from Reverend Clarence Locken. I'll take one. I'll take one. Thank you, sir. Uh, just for my reference. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. This, both of these handouts come from the book uh, Reverend Clarence Larkin, Larkin, The Dispensation of Truth, right? Um, I told you this book was written in early 1900s. He was a, a reverend from Pennsylvania, and God gave him an amazing gift to, as you can see, write. He has an entire book with these graphs that really kind of just really spell out some things that we read in the Bible, but it gives us a visual notion to it, right? So the, 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 what I would like for us to cover today, before tonight, before we get into our second topic, is I want you to take a look at your chart, per se. And uh, for our those viewing online, the AV team is going to put it on the screen so you can see it. So take a look at that chart. This shouldn't be familiar. It shouldn't be new to you. We passed these out a couple weeks ago, so everyone should have it and should have time to kind of look at it. So I, it's, a, it's not so much a test, but I want us to kind of talk through this. So my first question is, what is the church age? What is that? And so I'll tell you what it's not. It's not how old the church is. <laughs> so it's not, so how old are you? No, it's not how. So can someone tell me the microphone is up? If you don't say it, I can repeat it back. What is the church age? And you've got some handouts that can help you right there. The church age is what? What is that? I'll give you a hint. It is the time that we are what? Right. This is the dispensation or the period of time that we are in from a, a Bible uh, viewpoint. So somebody tell me what is the church age? The first resurrection of the saints. Um, close, but that doesn't define the church age. What do we mean by the church age? What is the church age? Period of time. I like that. We're starting good. The period, it is a period of time. Go ahead. Come on. Come on. You're telling me you're defining what an age is. That's good. That's very good, Sister Dietrich. But Sister Rita, can you bring it home? We, we're running a relay race. You got the last leg. Come on. What is the church age? That's all right. Okay, good, good. So we got some good stuff there. Kelly, you want to add something before we move forward? Okay, so I've heard a lot of things. I've heard when it begins. I've heard when it ends. And there were some things that were spot on. There were some things that we're still working on. So let's first define what is the church age. And then let's talk about when did it start and when did it ends. All right, so let's, so let's talk about So the, the church age itself, right, is the, it is the I, I don't want to use big theological words because theolo theologians would say it's the dispensation, right? And dispensation just means a, a period of time. Remember we talked about those different dispensations like the time of the flood, the law. Those were different dispensations, how God engaged humanity during a certain period of time. It's like a bookmark. Y'all see these boots I got up here? I got these boots to remind us of unity today. But you ever seen books on a shelf and you have the book shelf, one bookmark, and then you have another bookmark, right? And then you have a bunch of books in between it. That's what an age is. So it's just a, a age is just a period of time that begins and ends. That's what an age is. It's the time that it, something starts and then something is. So all the books in between these two books would be the church age. So the church age, now some theologians agree, some say when Jesus died on the cross. That's when the church started. So the church age is the start or the beginning of what we know as the church or the bride of Christ. So in a simple definition, the church age is when the church 
begin. This thing called the church. Many of the Old Testament prophets couldn't see the church. Some of them saw past the church, but they didn't see they couldn't see the church. This time period called the church, many of those prophets missed it. Not that they missed it, it's that God didn't reveal it to them. A lot of the Old Testament uh, uh, Jewish people, they just saw kind of the end times. They didn't see this mystery, this pearl called the church that was a, a combination of Gentiles and Jews. I just said something right there. So the church age is the period of time that combines in Christ people that are Jewish and people like us that are Gentiles that are united in Jesus. Did you hear what I just said? So the church age is this body, this dispensation, this period of time that was birthed, we'll talk about that in a moment, that is a gathering of a gathering of Jewish people and Gentiles that believe in Jesus, the Messiah, that he died and he, he rose on the third day. So that group, that that, that, that gathering of people, this time period of when the church began, which some theologians say at Calvary when he died. Some theologians believe the church age began at the day of Pentecost. Y'all remember Pentecost in the book of Acts when, the, when he told them to go up in the upper room and wait. And Jesus said, I got to go and send you a comforter. I'm sending someone. So regardless of Technically, if it began at Pentecost, or if we believe when Jesus died on the cross, the church is the body of Christ, this unseen, not a building, but this unseen gathering of Jewish people that believe that Jesus has already died, and Gentiles who are like me and you who are not the physical seed of Abraham. We are the spiritual seed of Abraham. That's why the Bible says that any man be in Christ, he is Abraham's seed. So we're Abraham's seed because we're in Christ, not because we have biological Jewish blood in our bodies. Does that make sense? So you're looking at a big old chart of not just, I mean, the church age is on there's a lot of stuff on here. But <laughs> the church age, y'all see on that chart? Where it's, where it's, according to the chart, uh, Reverend Larkin is saying that the church age began in Acts. You see that, that, that where it says the all, the king, the e ecclesiastical dispensation of grace. That's another name for this age is the age of grace. The dispensation of grace. You, you'll need those if you don't have those. This is the age of grace there. Those handouts right there. The age of grace, dispensation of grace. So that's what you see. And Matthew said the, that the church age was a hidden treasure. That's why it talks about that pearl. It was a hidden treasure. The prophets were unaware of the church age. Matthew, I think that's 13 and 44 talking about that. So the church age is the time period where the Lord gathers his body through Jewish people that believe in the Messiah. And, and I make that, that reference of that believe in the Messiah because we have Jewish people who do not believe Jesus has come yet. Did y'all know that? We got Jewish people who believe in Jesus, but they don't believe Jesus come yet. They believe he on the way. They don't believe that he died on the cross. They believe uh, that, that, that the body was, they didn't believe he was resurrected, but they do believe that Jesus is coming. But they don't believe that Jesus has come. And those Jews who believe like that are not a part of the church. Did you hear what I just said? Although they're Jewish. For any Jewish person that does not believe that Jesus come and died on the cross and rose from the dead. Although they're Jewish, they are not a part of the church. So what you're saying, Pastor? I'm saying that when the Lord comes and raptures the church... Jewish people who don't believe it, it, that Jesus come will get left behind. That don't mean they won't make it to heaven. I just said they won't make the rapture. That's a whole other Bible teaching there. But I just need you to understand because we're talking about the church age. And why we need to know about the church age because that's the age we're in right now. We're in this age of grace. We're in this age of dispensation. But time is winding up. This age is winding up. It's about to go boom, dynamite. 
when does the church age end? Say that again. Did I say Isaiah's not in the church? No, the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I said he saw past the church. Those eagle eye prophets, see, look at this. If you got the chart, the church is just right here in this dispensation. Isaiah and them were seeing the, the millennial kingdom and way past this. So a lot of the Old Testament, the Lord, this was hidden from the Old Testament. God didn't show, God don't show everybody everything. Even if you're a prophet, that don't mean that you have a license to know all the mind of God. He'll show you some things, but that don't mean he'll show you everything. And the Old Testament prophets didn't see the church. Daniel was Daniel was could see stuff that's going on in Revelation that haven't even happened yet. But the church, this this pearl, this mystery, the church was a mystery. You follow what I'm saying? It literally was a God did not tell them that. They didn't know that was a part of the plan. That's how we got grafted in. Amen? It's through the age of the church. Now, I do want to make this clarification about some Jewish people. There are some Jewish people that are called Messianic Jews, and they believe that Jesus died, and they will get raptured with us. So not all Jews believe that Jesus had not come yet, but there is a, a sect called Messianic Jewish people who believe like we believe that Jesus already come, he already died, he's born of a virgin, he died on the cross, on the third day he arose. You follow what I'm saying? They are part of the church. So the church age is, a, is, is this group of Messianic Jews and Gentiles that believe that Jesus has come and are living According to his will. Amen. Don't let me leave out that part. Living according to his will. Amen. That's a prerequisite. Just because you say you just because you say you're a Christian, that don't mean you living like one. But the Bible says the Lord will allow the wheat and the tares to grow together and he goes separate them. So don't you worry about them people who fake Christians or who Christians who are just like not living with one. God, Jesus said, I'm going to separate them and I'm going to put the tares over here and the wheat over here. And I'm going to take the, the wheat and I'm going to put them in my barn. But those that are tares, I'm going to burn them. God, I am so in this Bible. So are, is everyone getting this picture of the church age? When did it start? When will it end? And it will end when? At the rapture. It's, I hate to say in, but it's like the, it, the church will be taken out of the earth realm. Is that better for you? Yeah. Instead of saying in, it's like, you're like when you move to a new, a new neighborhood, you don't end. You just get a new address. Yeah. When you move to that gated community and out them apartments, that, that don't mean that you ended. That means you moved on up like the Jeffersons. So the church going to get a Jefferson spirit and go leave earth and that will go up. Y'all see it? I'm, it's right here on the chart. Look here on the chart. Y'all see when the church is raptured, that will be the end of this dispensation. And the Lord, see where it says rapture, will meet the church in the air, in the middle of the air. Y'all see that on the chart? And then they will go up. He will meet the bride, and then we will have the marriage supper, the feast, and the judgment of the nation. We're going to get into all that tonight. But I just want you to be clear that you know, if, if, you, if anybody asks you what's the church age, you can answer it. If somebody say, what is really the church? Is it, is it four walls? Mm -mm. The church is what? Comprised of believers in Christ that are Jewish Messianic Jews and Gentiles that believe in Christ and living according to his will. Those are the people that's going to get raptured. Now, for the Jewish folk who are left behind, they still will have an opportunity to come to the Lord, but unfortunately for them and everybody else who don't accept Jesus and get on in this church, they're going to have to go through the tribulation. Y'all see that next to the church and that them seven years of tribulation? They're going to have to live, and it's going to be hard to live for Jesus during the tribulation. It's going to be hard to talk about I, for Christ I live, for Christ I die. It's going to be a whole lot harder than it is now. 
When you can't buy, sell, or property, or do anything without uh, the mark of the beast, and you know when you take that, that's it, right? You can't repent for the mark. Y'all, y'all quiet on me now. You cannot repent from taking the mark of the beast. If you take the mark of the beast to live, you just, you just punched your ticket to die. You cannot say, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take this mark. I only took this mark because I needed some gas. Lord God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I only took this mark. My baby needed some food. Lord, I'm sorry. I only took this mark because I needed to buy a car. There's no coming back from that. It's eternal damnation upon that transaction. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Jump in. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right. Tech, the technology. Yeah. Great question. Great. great. So, so this is the the. Gosh, it's okay. it's, a, it's a lot, but it's okay. So the the mark of the the beast, right? Anything that's doing anything in any organization, any community, any club, or any company. It got to have structure, right? It got to have a network, right? It got to have a system to function. If you're going to be effective as a group, as an organization, as a company, as a nation, no matter what you do, you got to have a system to operate on, right? If all y'all got some type of computer or t a telephone, whether you got an Apple or Android, and it has its own operating system. Now, the Apple system is different from the Android system, and the Android system is different from the Apple system, but nonetheless, they are a system or a platform that allow you to call, text, email, video chat, etc. right? The United States has a system. Our government operates on a system, right? We pay taxes, right? We have a legislative branch. We have an executive branch. We have a judicial branch. We have the states. We have Congress. We have the House of Representatives. We have state government. We have federal government. We have federal judges. We have state judgments. We have a system of operation. So will the, the beast and the Antichrist. And it's called the beast system. Now, what Sister Threda was talking about is the technology. And the beast system is already here. It's not coming. It's here. The beast system is already here. It's not coming. It's here. And many of us use parts of it every day and don't think nothing of it. So when you say, hey, Siri, Siri, what's the weather? Well, the weather in Winder is 76 degrees. That's going to be a part of the B system. When you go take your phone and you put your fingerprint and to unlock it, B system. When you get your money, you used to get your money with a check and you had to go to the bank. Now it's digitally direct deposited. The system already here, y'all. It's already here. So it's not that it's coming. It's already here. And I personally believe the Antichrist is already here. He just has not been revealed yet. So it's not something that's coming, it's something that's already here, but it's going to ratchet up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase in such a way that we won't be able to do anything without it. Right. Just like right now, you still can go to the store, in, in most stores, and still pay cash for something, right? But eventually, everything's going to be digitized. So at the click of something, a whole system or a whole group of people can be controlled. Did you hear what I just said? So to answer your question, Sister Three, it's not coming. It's already here. It's just going to increase, increase. It's going to get more digital, more digital, more to the point where you won't be able to do anything if you don't have a Wi-Fi or an Internet connection. That's what I'm saying. The infrastructure is exactly, exactly. And it had to slowly come up on us because if it came all at one time, people would reject it. The enemy is very shrewd. He didn't throw all this on us. We slowly, slowly start coming up now. Oh, I can get my debit card on my phone. I can pull up my debit card on my phone and go to the Publix and don't have to take out my wallet and scan my phone, beep, and get my groceries. Matter of fact, I did it last night. 
You used to have to have money in your hand and go to, ch- y'all follow what I'm saying? The technology, and I'm not saying technology is a demon. I'm not saying technology is bad. I'm saying that's the system that the beast will use to manifest his agenda. You see the difference in that? I ain't saying tech, I ain't saying the internet the devil. But he going to use it. Y'all see the difference in that? So it's not something to be afraid of. It's something we need to be aware of. But more importantly, just don't take that mark. Prayerfully, we'll be gone. Prayerfully, the church will be out of here when it get that bad. But, but we, no, no man knows the time or day when he go come. So we don't know how bad things will get before the church gets out of here. So it's better to be prepared and be ready than to be unprepared and be like them five foolish virgins who was going out looking for oil when the bridegroom cometh. So what is the church? The church is the church age. I think y'all are clearing that. When did it start? When will it end? But my last question is, who is a part of the church and who is not? And I love to make the distinction between the true church. Y'all, I'm about to do a somersault off this desk because most people think the church is the church. But that's not true. There's the true church and then there's the false church. There's a religious system that's set up that looks like a church, that operate like a church, and the Lord ain't nowhere in it. There is a religious system that has protocols that got pastors and organizations and structure, and it looks like the church, it sounds like the church, it acts like the church, but it does not have God's spirit. So that's why I make the emphasis of the rapture will be for the true church, not the harlot church. Not the false church. Not that, that, that church that does the acts, the, the pharisaical and the Sadducees church. They know, how to, they know how to act like church. They know how to look like church, but, but they, they don't have God's spirit with them. They're going through the motion. They don't have a relationship with God. When they come up, when, they, when it's their time up, the Lord going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. But what blesses me about that text, that scripture, is that the people are saying, God, wait a minute. I was a part of the church. God, I, I cast out devils in your name. I'm glad I said that. We're going to talk about that. God, I cast out devils in your name. God, I, ran, I did all these things. I visited the six. I did these things. But God going to say, I didn't know you, though. So the, the, the fake church is not going to know Christ, even though they're going to act like they do. That's why I spent all my time in Bible study and preaching, trying to strengthen God's people to make sure you're in the true church and not the one that's looking like the church. Because it's easy, thank you, Lord. It's easy to fake Christianity. It's easy to look holy and don't be holy. It's easy to dress like you saved and not be saved. It's easy to look like you saved and don't even pray to the Lord. It's easy to act like you are a Holy Ghost filled Christian and you out here just flipping tricks out here in the street. But you come in here with a long dress and fooling people and smiling. So Christianity is easy to fake. That's why God say man look on the outside but I look at the heart. People will come up in here and all you can see is the outside. Y'all follow what I'm saying? It's easy to fake pastoring. You got a lot of fake pastors. But watch this. They good communicators. They know the word. The devil knows the word. Every pastor is not sent by God or called by God. So if you don't have my favorite word, the D word, discernment, you won't be able to tell the difference between a real one or a fake one. You won't be able to tell the difference if God with them or God used to be with them, he ain't with them no more. Because God will leave you and still allow you to be in that position. God's spirit will leave you and still allow the person to still be in that role. As Saul. Saul was still king and God's spirit had left him. He still let him wear the crown, even though he was no longer. God said, I'm look, I done, I got somebody else. But people who don't have discernment, they'll look at his crown and think God's still with it. Did y'all hear what I just said? That's why we fast and start on Saturday, I mean Sunday, for dis- greater discernment. In the last days, many will be deceived. The Bible said many false prophets will go out and deceive many. 
Y'all got that? So we know, are we clear on what's the church age? When will it end? Who's in it? Who's not in it? The true church. Right? And then my last, I'm not going to ask you this. I'm going to tell you this because I want to get to the next part. Is what will happen to everybody that's not in the true church? Everyone that does not get raptured will be left behind on earth. They will have to deal with the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, and they will have to live in a world where God's, where God, the, the thing, the salt has been taken out. The Bible says we are Christians, the salt of the earth. And what does salt do? It seasons, it flavors. What else did it do? If you don't have a refrigerator, you can put salt in the meat and it'll do what? It preserves it. So when the preserver has been removed, the meat rots. The meat rots when there's no salt to keep the gnats and the maggots out of it. The earth will go through that rotting experience when the church is removed. So they're going to have to fend for themselves. And for those that took the mark, can't, can't do nothing for them. But those who don't, don't take the mark, it's going to be hard. The Bible says war to them that's going to have children during that time. It's going to be a hot mess down here. And you don't want no parts of it. So I'm telling you now, live right, do God's will, and be raptured, or the Lord call you home before then. We good on that? I've got to change gears. If you need some additional reference, look at Matthew 25, 1 through 13. We're not going to go through it. It talks about the kingdom of heaven and those virgins. Five was wise. Five was, and you notice they were called virgins. That means they all say they was in the church. Y'all missed that. It didn't say 10 harlots. It didn't say 10 hookers. It said 10 virgins. So that was saying they all are church women or church people. They all say they were, but only half of them went and rest. They weren't ready to meet him. I'm going to leave that where it goes. We got to move because I got to get into this. Can a Christian have a demon? Can a believer, someone who has asked the Lord in their heart to save them, can they have a demon? I didn't say an unbeliever. I said a Christian. And I ain't talking about a fake Christian. I'm talking about a real Christian. So I'm not playing on words here. Can a Christian, a real one, have a demon? I'm asking y'all. I heard no. I heard yes. Some people saying yes. Some people saying no. How can a demon spirit indwell in the same body as the Holy Spirit? Can a demon spirit be in the same house, temple, house? The, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Temple. Can a demon be in the house along with the Holy Spirit? Come on, Sister Jeanette, what you saying? I'm hearing a lot. Yes, ma'am. Supposed to be Christian. Uh-huh. They go in a negative way. You think that's like a demon. So a Christian, they go in a negative way. You think they, the demon bothered with them. The question on the table tonight is, can a believer, can a Christian a, that believe in Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost, can they have a demon also uh, taking up a little room in that space? Yes, ma'am. Right. That's the key. The key. Supposed to be. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. All right. Right. 
those watching online, the jury, we have a, we have a hung jury tonight. Uh, half of the jurors feel like, though, you cannot, and half of them feel like you can for those who are watching online. So let's dig a little deep in the word and see if we can hopefully answer this question tonight. Can a, can a Christian, or a real Christian, not a fake one, not a play fake, can a real Christian also have a demon? In them. All right. Well, let's take a look. First of all, let's start at the beginning. Uh, a person, a person has three parts to them, right? A person has a spirit. Uh oh. A person has a soul. I'm trying not to preach. And a person has a what? A body. Amen. So a person has each one of these things, right? And they're all different, and they do different things. Am I right? Yeah. So a person is threefold nature. Like God, the Trinity, we're made in his image. So we, too, are threefold. We have a spirit. Hold on, Sister Rita. We have a soul. Yeah, you got to hold your horses now. I'll let you talk. You got to hold your horses now. You got a spirit. You got a soul. And you got a body. Right? 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 So um, in the New Testament, the word for spirit it's called pneuma. I hope I'm spelling this right. Me and these, yeah. In, there we go. P N E, that's a P, it don't look like it. So the New Testament says the spirit of the man is actually, it's called pneuma, right? Um, the spirit of, the, of you, because everybody in here got each one of these. You got a body, you got a soul, and you got a spirit. Everybody agree with that? We good so far? All right. So I'm going to talk a few minutes about. This part, because this, this is the best part of you. I don't care how your body look. <laughs> I don't care what's going on with your soul. But the best part of you is this part, because this is the spirit part of you. Amen? This is the part of you that allows you to perceive and understand spiritual things. When you really pray, you're praying out of your spirit, man. Faith is located in your spirit man so this allows you to understand perceive pick up to identify spiritual things is your spirit amen let me give you some bible first corinthians 2 and 14 the bible says in first corinthians 2 and 14 the bible says in first corinthians 2 and 14 but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness unto him, nor can he even know them because they are spiritually discerned or spiritually received or spiritually understood or spiritually processed. Y'all got that? So the natural man has a problem with this because this is, I like to say this is the God part of you. <laughs> Y'all got that? We good on the spirit? All right, let's keep going. Now, let's go to that next, this, this, this one right here. Your soul, right? Your soul, I love this part too. Your soul is the part of you that is your emotions. Your soul is your intellect. Your ability to be smart and take tests and to know facts, right? That's a part of your soul. So your soul is your emotions, how you feel, right? It's also your intellect, what you know, your knowledge, excuse my spelling, and it's also your will. Your will, your want to. Well, I, I don't want to do that. That's your will. Yeah, I do it. That's your will. So your soul part of you is your emotions, it's your intellect, your mind, Intellect, mind, y'all got me? Emotions is how you feel. Mind is what you think. And then this gate part, Lord have mercy. This gate that lets things in or let things out or block stuff or don't want to, that's your, that's your will. All right? That's your will. But that's all that's in the soul. So this is another part of you. So you have a spirit. You have a soul. Right? Right? Now, let me tell you what the Bible teaches. Y'all look at, uh, give, me, give me Ephesians real quick. Ephesians 2. Look what the Bible says, Ephesians 2. The Bible says, and you he made alive who were dead. 
and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Keep going. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan, another word, name for Satan. And the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. But my point in sharing this with you, the Bible says that at one point in your life, you were dead. But you was alive. But you was dead. Sound like a zombie to me, right? So the, the Bible is saying, watch this. Y'all stay with me here. You were not physically dead. You were spiritually dead. When you were not saved, this wasn't turned on. The spirit was, it was there, but it, it, wasn't, turn, it wasn't activated. That's why he's saying you was dead in your sin and your trespasses because this right here was not in connection to God. This right here was not in communion with God. This right here was not in covenant with God before you got saved. As a result, before you got saved, you had no perception, no understanding, or no ability to understand spiritual things. Y'all got that? But then, something happened. And you made a decision. To follow Jesus. Lord have mercy. We call that the new birth. That's what Nicodemus didn't understand. Was like when he went to go talk to the Lord. He said, I don't understand how can a man be born again. The reason you were born again. Not through your mother's womb. But I told you you were dead. So then when you gave your life to Christ. And Jesus came into your heart. He quickened your spirit man. Is this making sense, y'all? So when you got saved, the light switch was turned on. The telephone was reconnected. It became, it, his spirit quickened. And watch this. So through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, entered your human spirit at salvation. Y'all got that? And that began life in you. Whew, Lord have mercy. And I know that's kind of confusing because I was already alive, but you was dead. But when you gave your life to the Lord, the Lord, he said, Jesus, come into my heart, save my soul. Then, boom, he comes into your spirit. He quickened. Amen? Let me give y'all some Bible. Give me 1 John 5 and 11. 1 John 5 and 11 and 12. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. The Bible says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. So when the sun comes in, this turns on. Yes, we, are we good on that? We good on that? So at the moment of salvation, at the actual moment that you give your life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit then comes and dwells in your spirit, man. Your spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of your temple. It's not my, you see what I'm saying? He said he's dwelling in the temple of the Holy Ghost. Right? The Holy Spirit comes in here in you and you come alive spiritually. Are we clear on that? All right, let's keep going. So, watch this. This is where we shift in gears. I need you to pay attention. I'm going to move this out of the way. <laughs> Demon spirits, a.k.a. unclean spirits. A.K.A. fallen angels who used to be in heaven who revolted with Satan and followed him to earth. All of them the same people. Y'all with me? Demons, unclean spirits, are confined to the soul and the body of a believer. Demon spirits are confined they can't touch your spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit is. But they are confined to these areas of you. Your body, your soul. Pastor, what you mean by that? Y'all remember on Sunday, for those of you who were here, and I preached and I talked about Matthew, the 17th chapter, about the boy 
who was having them epileptic seizures. And I told you he had a sickness, but he really had a demon that was masked as the sickness. So the sickness was afflicting his body. The sickness was attacking his body. That demon was attacking his body. Y'all hear me? The sickness, that demon was masking his sickness. So for a Christian, for a believer, for a believer, your spirit, for a believer, your spirit cannot be taken over, possessed, or influenced by a demon. Because the Holy Spirit is up in there. He got it on lock. Once you gave your life to the Lord, he entered in and he stood in the door like this. Try me if you want to. But that's just your spirit. Your soul and your body, that's a whole other thing because those are, those are different levels of you. Right? Hear me now. Hear me now. So for a Christian, your spirit cannot be taken over by a demon, but the soul, your mind. How many of you know Christians that have mental breakdowns? How many know Christians that are sick and got all types of diseases and diagnoses right now, but they're real Christians? Do you see what I'm saying? Can't touch the spirit, but can afflict the soul and the body. Still a demon, even though we don't often call it that. But that's the purpose of deliverance ministry. Deliverance ministry is aimed at removing and casting out these unclean spirits out of the other parts of you so that Jesus can reign all over you, not just in one area. You know, we, we say, I surrender all, I surrender all. Do we really? We say that, but do we, there are parts that Jesus don't have access to. There's some of y'all in here, Jesus has been trying to get in your soul for a minute. He's been trying to get in your mind. He's been trying to get in your emotions. He... Y'all acting, acting deep now. Some of y'all watching online, Jesus been knocking at the door. He got your heart, but, but I'm talking about up in here. He don't have access to this. That's how a Christian can say they love God and still be fornicating. Yeah, I, they love God. Yeah, he in here, but he ain't got control of the will. He ain't got control of the will. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of the Father who sent me. So a true Christian has yielded all these to him, not just one part. Y'all hear what I just said? Y'all hear what I just said? Now, let me flip the script. For an unbeliever, for somebody that's not saved, this is turned off. They fool around and get in sin because, <laughs> you know, sin opens the door. Sin gives demons a legal right to come and attack you or tempt you. Sin opens the door. It invites. It's an invitation. For an unbeliever, y'all with me? That Jesus, the Holy Ghost, ain't in their spirit. Watch this. They fool around. A spirit can come in and take it all. The Bible calls this demon possession. So the answer is a Christian cannot be demon possessed. An unbeliever can. Because an unbeliever, the demon can come in and attack body, soul, and spirit. Did you hear what I just said? For the unbeliever, the, the demon can, can attack the body, can attack the soul, can attack the spirit. Did not Job, the Lord, tell Satan, do not touch his body. Do not kill him. So Job was saved. Job loved God. And he had all types of affliction. Who you think was doing that? It wasn't God. It was a demon. Did you hear what I just said? In the story, in, in the Bible talks about Job. All those things that happened to him, a demon was behind it. But watch this. God allowed it. God didn't send the demon. God allowed him and he gave him certain parameters. Don't you kill him. Yes, he took his children. Yes, he, he lost his money. Yes, he had boils on his body. That was a demon, y'all. You see what I'm saying? But it didn't, couldn't touch his spirit. But an unbeliever? Can be demon. Let me give you a Bible. Give me Mark 5 real quick. Y'all remember the man in the tombs? I'm going to go through this quick. Mark 5. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country 
of the Gardarians. Keep going. Come on. Come on. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. This is a little off because it says spirit like it was singular, but actually he had legion. Legion is many demons. Some theologians believe he had about almost a thousand demons in him. And he was living amongst the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains that had pulled apart by him and the shackles broken pieces, he had supernatural strength. That's another thing that's a sign of a demon. A person can be super strong. It's not their strength. It's that demon's power. And the shackles broken pieces. Neither could they tame him. They would put him in iron shackles and he would bust them like plastic handcuffs. And always at night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs. He was crying out, cutting himself with stones. This man was suicidal. He was butt naked in the tombs, cutting himself, crying out, and acting like something was wrong with him. Something was wrong with him. He was demon possessed. Keep going. Keep going. How much time I got? Keep going. Verse 6, and when he saw Jesus, And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Good God, I can't get some of y'all to worship him. But the man with the demons worshipped him. That was a part of him that still recognized the Lord. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Stop. That was not the man talking. That was the demon talking. The demon cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. The demon was asking for mercy. The demon was asking not to be removed out of his house. Verse 8, for he said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Jesus was doing an exorcism. Jesus cast that devil out. He said, then he asked him, what is your name? Y'all hear that? So the demon is interrogating Jesus. And he answered and said, my name, I'm I'm sorry, he asked the other way around. He asked him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. That's why I said it wasn't just one spirit. It was a bunch of spirits up in that man. And also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. They knew when they saw Jesus, their time was up. They knew when they saw Jesus, Jesus was about to dislodge them out of this man because when a demon takes over, they take like territory. They they call it their house. That's why the Bible says when you cast out a demon and he's out, he, he, he goes around looking for another house to occupy. And the house is people. Remember I told you a demon has to have a person to use? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Come on. Now a large herd of swine was feeding in the mountains. Keep going. So all of the demons, all of the demons begged him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. The demons asked Jesus, can you send, we know you're about to cast us out the man, but can we at least stay in the area? So we'll, we'll go in the pigs for a little bit and, and, and get in an animal. That lets you know even an animal can be demon possessed. Y'all miss that? All these dogs barking. Y'all be told, they don't bite. The devil is a liar. I don't trust you or that demon in your Cujo dog. (laughs) Demons can go in animals, y'all. Not just people. But anyway, that's another Bible study. And at once Jesus gave them, Jesus allowed them to go into the pigs. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. That man that was butt naked in the tombs, cutting himself, acting crazy, had supernatural strength, had at least 2,000 demons in him. That's why they said, Jesus, we are many. Our name is Legion. Keep going. And they ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Them pigs didn't want them demons in them. Them pigs ran for the water. I'm going to leave that right there. So that was an example of, biblical example of demon possession. Where a a demon has taken over a person's body, soul. If if he wanted to be free, he couldn't because those demons was controlling his will. You follow what I'm saying? Just like when you see these mass murderers and these people that do all these heinous crimes, I always look at the mugshot because I look in their eyes, I can see that demon in them. 
That's what I'm looking for. I ain't just trying to be nosy and see if I know them. I'm trying to see if I can see that spirit in them. Y'all follow what I'm saying? All these things. We need to have better crime and better gun violation. No, we need to have some fasting and praying and cast these devils out these folk. Because if the devil ain't in them, he can't, he can't pull the trigger. That's another thing. Anyway, I want to show y'all. Get, keep my video. I want to show y'all this video. And in this video, don't, don't, not, yet, not yet, I got to set it up, please. Thank you. In this video, a demon-possessed man enters this restaurant. This lady who's in the military immediately discerns what's going on, and she engages him. I want you to listen for the spirit that speaks through the man and even watch how she brings forth deliverance ministry. Now, it's a little confusing because it's in Spanish. But even though it's in Spanish, you can still see everything I just said. And then next week, well, when we meet again, I'll go into this because I don't want to leave y'all with this. And I plead the blood of Jesus to bind any transferring spirits. Y'all covered. Y'all fine. But watch this demon-possessed man walk up on this lady in the military. She cast the devil out of him. It's coming up out of him now. You hear the demon? Y'all heard that? That was the demon. That's the demon speaking through him. See his body contorting. trying to get free. Thank you. So, what I just showed you all in this uh, video, a demon or demons had taken over his body. You saw him slapping himself in the face. I mean, hard, not like this. He was hitting himself like he was fighting. It had taken over his soul, his emotions, his, his mind, his will, all that was... A, the demon was, was working all that, and even his spirit. But that lady, that young lady, even though she was about this size, had power in God. Now, what she did is called deliverance ministry. If you do not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, don't you dare try this. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, don't you dare try this. You'll be like the seven scuns of Sceva who tried to cast out that man, and the demons jumped out of him and whooped him up. And what you mean, Pastor, by the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I thought I had to. Every believer receives the Holy Ghost when they get saved. He comes in here. Everybody got the Holy Ghost. But the Bible talks about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's what happened during. Do you know how we get, when we get saved, we get baptized with water? When we get saved, we get baptized with water. It identifies us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's an outward sign. We all get baptized with water. But Jesus says there's another baptism of fire. That was the baptism of the Holy Spirit 
And it does have an evidence of speaking of tongue, but that's a different type of, that's a baptism where the Holy Spirit is poured out on you. And you have, a, that's what we say, I've given you authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That's how that little four, about four feet, five inch woman could make that big old dude fall to the ground because she was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And that spirit was being subject to the spirit of God in her. So if you ain't baptized with the Holy Ghost, don't you try this. You ain't ready for that yet. But I'm showing you this because this is real. In the last days, there's going to be a lot of manifestations of demon spirits. And this will be like an like a appetizer for the stuff go come. So if you don't get an idea of what's happening now, I don't want you to be shocked. It'll be overwhelming for you. This is nothing compared to what's coming. So when people miss Bible study, oh God, Lord be with them. Because when these things start happening, some of you going to go on your jobs and go see demon manifestations. Now, they're not all that extreme. <laughs> they're not all that extreme. But they are like that and even more. And as a believer, you need to be aware of this. You need to be at least binding the devil. If you don't know how to engage them like she did, just bind the devil. So Satan, I bind you in Jesus' name. The Lord said in Matthew 18, 18, whatever you bind on earth, I bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I loose. At least bind the devil. But don't engage. She, this wasn't her first rodeo, y'all. She done cast out demons before. And she wasn't scared. She wasn't like, ooh, no, I can't. I'm scared. Because they will make sounds, noises, and when they come out, uh, they come out a lot of different ways. One of the ways demons come out, they vomit out. I have seen it with my own eyes where a demon was cast out and a person vomited and the spirit came out. They will also come out through, um, how can I say this? When you release yourself. Like, oh gosh, there was one guy, uh, you know how you ever been to somebody like a hosp cancer hospital and everybody got cancer on the whole ward and they got a particular smell? Y'all know, some of y'all know, I got a cancer ward, it's have a particular smell. <laughs> this one person, he cast out a person who had a spirit of cancer on them. And when, they, when it came up, that same smell was in the room. It was, that spirit of cancer was coming out of them. So this is how a Christian can have a demon in their body, arthritis, sickness, or in their soul, bipolar, schizophrenic, Double-minded, unstable emotions, will all over the place. Oftentimes, a demon is behind that. And Jesus wants to take over all of us so he can truly reign in our spirit, in our soul, and in our body. So that's how a Christian can still have a demon or be afflicted by one. But it's not the same as demon possession. Questions before we go? Right. Well, I wouldn't classify that in a greater work only because Jesus did that. You see what I'm saying? Greater, I would classify greater work would be going beyond the things Jesus did. But Jesus cast out devils. So a greater work will be doing more than what Jesus and the disciples already did, if that makes sense. It's foreign to us because we don't see a lot of that, right? Like some of them holiness churches and them Pentecostal churches, y'all pick at uh, all the time. They be happening, going on. Uh, a lot, that's more prevalent in those spaces. But demons are everywhere. They're not just in Pentecostal churches. They're in Baptist churches. They're in Methodist churches. They're on your job. They're, on your, they're in your family. And if you ain't prepared to deal with them, oh, my goodness. And they all don't manifest like that. Some of them slick. Some of them subtle. Right? They ain't all. You can have a demon of pride. Yeah. It's a spirit of pride. They look, they look down at people. That's a spirit. Even though they ain't hitting nobody, hurt nobody. But they got a, that's a demon. That's not of God. That's not God's spirit. But a demon can be behind that. Y'all see what I'm saying? Most people, Christians, don't, I don't say I don't want to say I got a demon. Yeah, you you're thinking in a negative context. But if if a spirit, if an unclean spirit is influencing you, you got a demon. Not if they're influencing you, you got a demon. You said something you shouldn't have said because you got in your feelings and your flesh. 
You follow what I'm saying? It, ain't, it, it, it don't have to always be that extreme for the enemy to use you. Questions? Yes, sir, before we close out. Uh-huh. What's your question directly? Right. So I think Job was a different case <laughs> because the Lord was trying to make a point to Satan. Like Job wasn't about Job. Job was about the Lord having a conversation with Satan and saying, hey, this one right here, they're mine. And, and, then, the, and then Satan said, no, he ain't. The only reason he's yours is because you, you gave him everything. He got everything. He rich. He got a family. He got thousand cattle on a thousand here. He, he got, the only reason he's serving you is because of stuff you've given him. So the Lord was trying to sow Satan. No, he's serving me because of what's in his. That's why he's serving me. So that, I think that's totally different than that. That was just a Job thing. I don't think God does it to everybody. If, does that make sense? Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, you're talking about James. We're talking about the temptations. But guess what? You said the key word. What's that? Will. The will. Some of the stuff we get into is because we have not submitted this to God. Some of the temptation we deal with because we've not, we've not said, God, you make the call. Too many of us, we trying to make the call. And then it don't work out. And then we're all over the place. We have not submitted our will to God. So some temptations we experience because we have not given this to God. We trying to be God of us. Did you hear what I just said? We trying to sit on the throne in our lives and make the calls. So some of the temptation we get because we've not give, we haven't said, Lord, not my will, your will be done. We say, Lord, let my will be done until I get in trouble. Then I'll see what's your will. And we wonder where certain stains come from. And then our mind, them thoughts. The stuff we allow in our mind, the stuff we watch. It, at some point, y'all, we, we got to guard the stuff we allow in, in, this, in this temple. We'll watch anything online. We'll watch anything on social media. We, and it plants, the enemy can use it to plant seeds, demonic seeds. Just all he got to do is plant the seed. And then you'll be like, Eve, have God said we're going to surely die if we eat this fruit? You know the Lord told you don't bother that tree. And now you, now because he planted that seed in your mind, now you questioning God. And he didn't even touch you. He just dropped the seed of thought. That's why the Bible says casting down every high thing and every high thought that exhausted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought obedient and captive to Christ. A believer that does that have given their mind to the Lord. That's why he said keep your mind stayed on me and I'll keep you in perfect y'all know the word but knowing the word and applying the word ain't the same thing you can know the word all day long but if you ain't living it the enemy he, he'll be knocking you upside your soul door all the time all up in your will all up in your emotions and sisters he gets y'all a lot with this one I ain't picking on you sisters he gets y'all a lot with them emotions get y'all a lot Don't worry, he get the brothers with this. You know how many brothers done got caught up because of the... God, oh. So it, it, it's, it's equal, it's just different parts. So y'all, when we walk with God, you got to give all this to him. That should be your prayer doing this fast, Lord. I give you my body. I give you my soul. I give you my spirit. I give you my emotions. I yield my emotions to you. Don't let me feel nothing that ain't your will. Don't let me think nothing that you didn't, you didn't put the seed in my mind. Don't let me do anything that's not your will. That's when the Lord can reign in that part of you. And you can kick the devil out. That's how you can resist the devil and then he will flee. Is this helping anybody? Oh, we got to close out. It's 8 on 9. I went over time. But when we come back again, I got a, um, 
a, a pastor who's Hispanic, which is good because he's going to talk about that video and he tell us what she was saying. Because what she was saying was spot on as she was engaging that demon. But I think it's good for us to notice because the enemy, how he gets us, if you don't think that he can get in you, then he got you right where he wants you. If you don't believe that the enemy can use you, afflict you, or influence you as a believer, he got you right where he wants you. Yes, sir. Thank you. We got to pray for uh, the, the, um, Sister Rhonda and the family. We'll do that as we close out. And we'll pick this back up on next week. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the word tonight. We thank you for opening our eyes that we may see. Now, God, we ask you to bless Sister Rhonda and the um, Grissom and Finch family, God, as they lost their beloved one. God, Sister Helen, we just ask that you would give them a peace. Father, bless them with a peace that surpasses all understanding. Guard their minds and hearts through Christ Jesus. Let them know, God, that you are with them. Comfort them. Let them feel your love. Let them feel our love and support them through this time of bereavement. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Good night, everybody. Y'all be safe.